Thank you, Alice, and thank you for this uh, great initiative of the 100 Days Studio. It's such a great... Um, um, oh, that's the wrong... Uh, uh, it's such a such great and terrific initiative uh, with all these different uh, speakers, academics, as well as practice, uh, practitioners. Um, so it's very inspiring and it's very nice to be a part of it. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy also that George Beard is here with us too. Um, so that we can have indeed uh, a, a conversation uh, together on uh, just our, let's say, one of one of our uh, intellectual resources uh, uh, of our work within architecture, Hannah Arendt. Um, I think I don't have to introduce uh, uh, George uh, uh, here, but just briefly, um, he's a Toronto-based architect. Uh, he's the founder and principal of Beard Samson Neuert Architects. He studied uh, uh, at the Architectural Association, amongst on other places. He's actually a writer of numerous books, uh, amongst them The Space of Appearance, which is actually a term from Arendt's, uh, a notion from Arendt's writings, and writings on architecture and the city. He is also an educator. He has been a professor at Harvard, and he has been the dean of the John H. Daniel Faculty of Architecture at the University of Toronto. And uh, just to introduce briefly myself, I'm actually at the moment uh, an assistant, a senior assistant at the chair, as well as a lecturer at, uh, at the chair of Professor Tom Avermaete at the EGH in Zurich. I studied architecture and urban design at the Delft University of uh, Technology. Uh, where I also wrote a dissertation, which is called At Home in the World, which actually stresses uh, the public aspects of, aspects of architecture through the lens of Hannah Arendt. But we have this conversation actually, uh, well, it co uh, coincides uh, with two publications. One is this uh, reflection on the work and the writings uh, and the teachings of, uh, of um, George Beard, which is really fresh from the press. Uh, I, I haven't had, uh, the, the book is not distributed uh, yet, or I think George already has a book, but, but uh, I didn't see it yet. Uh, but this is a great book on the work uh, and on his contribution to architecture. It's edited by Roberto Damiani. And um, uh, besides Michael Hayes, Kenneth Frampton, Peter Eisman, John Ackman, Pierre Vittorio O'Reilly, and many others. I also write a chapter in this book uh, where I reflect on uh, Hannah Arendt's, uh, well, as a, Hannah Arendt's writing as a source for George's uh, writings. And this, uh, second, uh, also um, a publication that I did not have myself yet, uh, but it's also just uh, from the press last week. The new is issue of OASA, which is called Table Settings, Reflections on Architecture with Hannah Arendt, which I edited together with Christoph Grave and uh, Katharina Kukuk. And it takes Hannah Arendt as a starting point for a reflection on architecture. And amongst others, uh, like also Pierre Vittorio Aureli, um, also George Beard contributed uh, to this issue with the reflections on Arendt's writings and how her ideas consciously as well as unconsciously has shaped his designs. This conversation today does encircle Arendt's ideas and how these ideas might be relevant to architecture. So that's uh, partly is that on public space, but it's a little bit broader uh, than that. I prepared a very brief introduction to her work, uh, which might be a bit abstract, but of course I can refer to uh, this OASA, uh, which is on the screen uh, now. Uh, if you want to have a more in-depth introduction to Arendt's uh, writings. Arendt was actually born in 1906 in uh, near Hanover in Germany. She studied philosophy with Martin Heidegger. She wrote her PhD with Karl Jaspers. And then, because of the upcoming Nazism in the 30s in Germany, she had to flee the country. She first fled to Paris, where she met Walter Benjamin then succeeded to flee to the United States, where she lived uh, until her death in 1975 in New York. All of her writings somehow can be understood from this experience, to be excluded from the public life, to experience radical changes in the realm of politics. 
the experience of totalitarianism. It changed her path from philosophy to politics. She literally distances herself from the vita contemplativa, as she stated, in favor of the vita activa. She did not go after an academic career, but preferred to be independent, to publicly discuss and write about topical issues, uh, uh, particularly political issues, in magazines like The New Yorker, as well as in many books. Amongst the books she wrote, oh, this is actually her, um, The Origins of Totalitarianism, 1951, The Human Condition, 1958, Eichmann in Jerusalem, 1963, and The Unfinished, The Life of the Mind, 1978. This, of course, is a very, very brief bio uh, biography, and it's in a nutshell, but you, George, you met her at least once at a conference on her work in, uh, at the Toronto University in 1972. So maybe you can, uh, from your experience uh, uh, with her, uh, reflect a bit more on Arendt as a person. Uh, well, uh, actually, you've done a pretty good job, Hans. I'm not sure I have a great deal to add. Um, I, I had first um, learned of her when I was still in London in the 1960s. Um, from a, a friend there um, called Sam Stevens, who recommended to me that I read The Human Condition. Um, and um, uh, I paid attention to what Sam recommended. So I, I read it. I was in the middle of trying to complete a dissertation. Um, and I um, I found her, her, her arguments um, about um, utilitarianism in the 18th and 19th century incredibly informative and useful in, in enabling me to frame the arguments of um, um, you know what eventually became the book of mine that you've already shown uh, the space of appearance there, it was originally going to be a dissertation it never got to be but it did come out as a book in 1995 so in and when i returned from london to toronto to teach at the university of toronto I met a colleague from York University who had been a student of Arendt's, a man called Melvin Hill. And it was Melvin who organized a festschrift for her at York University in 1972. And I was one of the speakers uh, at that event along with Kenneth Frampton. He, Kenneth and I were the two, uh, until you came along, we, were, we had a kind of patent on, on Arendt. Um, and so Kenneth and I both spoke at the conference, um, and, um, and we both met her there. I have to say, I was presenting very early arguments from my book at that time, and she admitted that she could not entirely follow. She was, she was perfectly friendly, uh, but she couldn't entirely follow how I was using her work. Uh, and alas, she died only three years after that, so I never had the opportunity to um, show her the final version of the book on, uh, that I wrote, in which I depended so much on her arguments. But um, as, as you, you yourself discuss in your contribution to um, uh, Roberto's um, uh, collection of essays, um, even though she, uh, she didn't quite follow my argument in my presentation, she and I had some very changes uh, in the general discussion which ended the conference at York and she was very happy with the pointed questions I asked her about certain aspects of her thinking. Yeah, I, to this biography I wanted to add a few comments, let's say, on the nature of her writing or the character of her uh, writings and then define four perspectives actually that we define also in this OAS and then I went on to ask your again, as the starting point of our conversation. So, Arendt actually is regularly presented as a political philosopher, but that's a term, term, a notion she rejected. Politics, she argued, dealt with the actualities, the topicalities of the world, with the hustle and bustle of the people in it. Philosophy, on the other hand, withdraws from these actualities in order to contemplate li on life and its structural and fundamental questions. Political philosophy for Arendt, therefore, was a contradictio in terminus. Instead of a strict philosophical approach, 
Arendt herself much more admired the writings of Walter Benjamin. It is Arendt that introduced Benjamin to the American public by editing and publishing a volume of English, English translations of his writings. In the introduction to this volume, she describes his writing as thinking poetically and his method as pearl diving. We are dealing here with some things she writes, I quote, with, which may not be unique, but is certainly extremely rare, the gift of thinking poetically. And this thinking, fed by the present, worked with a thought pre present, fragments. It can rest from the past and gather about itself. Like a pearl diver who descends to the bottom of the sea, not to excavate the bottom and bring it to light, but to pry loose the rich strains, the pearls and the strains, the pearls and the coral in the depths and to carry them to the surface. This thinking delves into the depths of the past, but not in order to resuscitate it the way it was and to contribute to the renewal of extinct ages." End of quote. This method of pearl diving also is an important characteristic of Arendt's writings. It does not present a fixed theory with static concepts, but evoked by the present, it aims to think through most mainly political actualities and revisit certain ancient concepts in the light of contemporary developments. Her writings thus are quite open-ended and often seem to contradict each other and so on. The method of pearl diving is also evoked by a kind of fundamental response to the experience of, mon of modernity. In the same introduction to Benjamin's essay, she writes, and I quote again, any period to which its own past has become as questionable as it has to us must eventually come up with the phenomenon of language, for in the past is contained, for in it the past is contained in a radical color. Uh, difficult words for me, in er eradicability, thwarting all attempts to get rid of it once and for all. The Greek polis will conti continue to exist at the bottom of our political existence, that is, at the bottom of the sea, for as long as we use the word politics, end of quote. This is what Arendt, Arendt aims to do in her writings, going back to the roots of the terms we use, the concepts that, we, that are inherent in these words. It's, of course, not for nothing that Arendt mentions Polis in this quote. It is not just an example to illustrate her attitude to, the, to modernity, but it has everything to do with her own focus, indeed, politics. Particularly in her book, The Human Condition, she, in a very concrete way, rereads the Greek Polis, particularly through the lens of Aristotle's writings. This brings us to the kind of second characteristic of her writings, I would say, it is, which, which is that they are very literal and concrete, uh, um, which is a kind of literal and concrete spatiality. It is rooted in cities and larded with spatial and architectural references, metaphors and concepts, such as public space, the space of appearance and the wall. She herself has stated once, in a reflection on the writings of Cariaspus, that spatial thinking is to be seen as political thinking, not because it's concerned by a specific site, space, or program, but it's because it's bound to the world and the people in it. Its deepest aim, she stated, and I quote, is to create a space in which the humanitas of man can ap appear pure and luminous. Luminous, that is, that is actually her, um, uh, aim of the of what she does also with her own writing so however despite such immediate architectural references her reflections wherein these references are used cannot be re read as directions her work is a trial to understand present developments not to predict a certain future the architectural terms therefore can be seen as pearls brought to the light of the present to understand what has been lost over time but which is still present in our language, language and still influences our ideas and ideals. The ideas of these kind of um, pearls is of course to offer a frame uh, to think. And Arendt um, actually presents thinking as examining whatever happens to come to pass or to attract attention 
regardless the result and specific, specific content, end of quote. In this brief remark, Arendt asserts two important aspects of thinking, which is also, of course, comes back to her own writings. First, thinking is evoked by the, the things that happen, by actual experiences. It aims to understand what happens or how it happened. And second, thinking is free, free to examine these actualities and experiences, not bound by the application of particular theories. To think freely, the human being requires the cap capacity of imagination, the ability to, ex to examine the experiences from different positions and to Im imagine where it comes from and where it might go. The end of thinking, Arendt continues in her introduction, is not contemplation, nor knowledge, truth, nor certainty, but meaning and understanding. And that's actually very important, I think. In that sense, that's also what she writes in the, in the human condition, in her introduction uh, to the human condition. To think is an attempt to understand. And how she writes it in the human condition is, what I propose, therefore, is very simple. It's nothing more than to think what we are doing. Now, this conversation, I, I want to start this conversation with a definition or a, a proposal of four themes that are that can be found in the writings of, of Arendt that are still relevant for the field of architecture today. These four themes, actually, we prepared, that, that is, we is Christoph Grafe, Katharine Kukuk, and myself, we prepared these themes for the, uh, as the starting point of our um, OASA issue that I just presented. The four themes are actually plurality, thresholds, culture, and action. And I will briefly introduce these, uh, but that might be a bit abstract, but I think that in our conversation, it will be much more concrete uh, thereafter. So first, the uh, first theme that can be derived from Arendt's uh, writings is this idea of plurality, which is very important uh, for Arendt. Arendt addressed the character of public space as a political thinker. She did not immediately think of the squares and streets of the city, even though her reference is, as I said, the Greek Agora and the central square in the polis. The essential aspect of public life for her is plurality. It reveals differences. Public life reveals differences. And of course, the background, uh, why she stresses this is of course, her experiences with Nazi Germany. For her, therefore, it's very important to state that men, not, uh, it's also always the plural, who live on the earth and inhabit the world. Each and every person, and that's uh, what she uh, uh, stresses again and again, possesses the capacity of beginning something anew, end of quote. This plurality of inhabitants of the world includes the plurality of perspectives and experiences of the world. And only through the multiplicity of these perspectives and the tactile experiences, Arendt states, we can be certain of the reality of the world. This concern about reality is not simply a philo philosophical quest, but it affirms also one's own position within a world in common. Important from an architectural perspective is obviously the idea that the world can be understood through the juxtaposition of numerous perspectives. But moreover, it's important to see how Arendt intertwines the human experience of appearance with this assurance of reality. This is not another metaphorical spatial term, but it embodies concrete and tangible experiences wherein all five bodily senses are involved, as can be derived from this quote from the life of appearance. In the world of appearances, she writes, reality is guaranteed by the threefold commonness. First, the five senses utterly different from each other have the same object in common. Members of the same species have the same context in common that endows every single object with its particular meaning. And finally, all other senses and sense endowed beings, though perceiving this object from utterly different perspectives, agree on its identity." End of quote. Note that appearance, which is very important for her, appearance itself is not a static fact, but a movement a movement of transition from the private realm into the public eye. It is through this movement that the senses are addressed, that others and otherness 
as well as the world in common is perceived. That brings it act actually to the second uh, theme, the threshold. In her writings, Aaron draws a sharp and contested distinction between the public and, public and the private realm. To her, public space depends on the appearance of people amongst one another, where they reveal their uniqueness amongst peers. Public space, therefore, is the domain of action and speech. The private realm, on the other hand, is the realm of withdrawal from the world, the domain of retreat, recuperation, and education. It is the domain of life events that go beyond public speech. The public, for Arendt, stands for freedom, the freedom to engage in the world, while the private realm is bound to the necessities of life. Actually, um, Arendt draws these distinctions in very architectural terms. In her writings, it appears as spatial distinctions between the public and the private. The privates need to be shielded from the public world and is surrounded by four walls. And then, these walls, these walls, and certainly also thresholds and doors and windows, which together safeguard the private realm, they constitute a spatial device in itself, which mediates between the public and the private, and which also shields the uh, public spaces as the political spaces. Architecturally spoken, it is this in-between space between public and private that offers the tactile experience of movement that I uh, um, framed previously, appearing in the world amongst others, as well as withdrawing from the public stage that is actually only possible through this, uh, through these thresholds. This actually also brings us to a, a, our, our third uh, theme, that of culture. Because Arendt also argues that these kind of walls and boundaries, as well as the laws, they are needed to offer a kind of st stabilizing protection, as is uh, in this quote, mentioned in this quote, which is on the screen now. And um, without a protection, uh, without which action and speech actually cannot uh, uh, happen. In the human condition, Arendt is concerned about the instrumental approaches to the world. She understands that new modes of production threatens the permanence of the world of things, as well as its commonality. How things are produced, anonymous in a factory or publicly in a small workshop, effectively makes a difference, particularly with regards to the consumption cycle of such artifacts. It moreover impacts the impossibility or the possibility of human beings to attach to the things that surround them. Arendt particularly is concerned about these changes as they are not neutral to human being nor to the human communi community. Even if things are human-made, she writes, they nevertheless constantly condition their human makers." End quote. It is in this perspective that Arendt also stresses the importance of culture. She writes, only the existence of a public realm and the world's subsequent uh, transformation into a community of things, which gathers men together and relates them to each other, depends entirely on, the, on permanence. If the world is co to contain a public space, it cannot be erected for one generation and planned for the living only. It must transcend the lifespan of mortal man. Without this transcendence and in, into a political earthly immortality, no politics, strictly speaking, no common world and no public realm is possible. Culture, that is according to Arendt, the ways in which people organize and structure the world of things, offers resilience and resistance against consumerism, decay, and deterioration. Culture is a sign of engagement in the world in common. It preserves and establishes the presence of a collective memory and of remembrance. By maintaining the world and taking care of the heritage of the past, it offers the world its permanence. In other words, how public things are ordered, structured, and how we experience them has an impact on our understanding of the world. Finally, we defined this idea of action, which is also, which is more abstract uh, with regard to uh, architecture, but it poses a question to the field of architecture. In the human condition, Arendt presents her well-known distinction between labor, work, and action as three separate modes of human activities on earth. 
labor deals with the cycle of nature and is directed to the survival of species. Work, on the other hand, creates the world. It produces the permanent things. It intervenes in the earth in order to make it an inhabitable world. And finally, there is the political activity, which is action and speech. Arendt, in the human condition, particularly focuses on this activity of action. It is, its fundamental characteristic is often overlooked or resisted, since action cannot be controlled. It is unpredictable, evoking unexpected events. It starts somewhere, sm somewhere small, but can evoke a process in which action builds upon action. It is the little flame that can turn a forest into ashes, the little act of resistance that can turn the tides. Action is related to the human capacity to start anew, to take initiatives and to interact. Although Arendt, for action, although for Arendt, action goes on directly between men and without the intermediary of or matter of things, it is suggested, uh, for instance, by uh, the political ph philosopher Bonnie Honig, um, that things are at work as well, even among actors in concert. From here onwards, and that's actually my final uh, sentence, we might ask ourselves, how can architecture act? Or how can architects act? And then with these words, actually, I want to give the floor to, um, for a reflection uh, and start of a conversation to George Beard. George. Okay, uh, thank you, Hans. Um... You want to get rid of the screen share? Um, yeah, I'm going Because I'm not that. showing any images. Um, I'm, I'm going to start um, by just making a few comments I, I'm on, on your, four, your four themes. Um, um, let's start with plurality. Um, I think it's very interesting. I, I mean, you say this, but I want to uh, um, um, uh, underline it that uh, plurality has to do with the individual. Um, and that's why, that's why she ob objects to the term man and insists on men in the plural rather than man because she doesn't want the generalization as she talks about the kind of uniqueness of each individual. Um, and um, I think given that the world we're in at the moment, I think it's quite interesting that we're now um, uh, uh, very um, uh, uh, familiar with the phenomenon of what's called identity politics. And of course, this, it, this is a social phenomenon which comes long after Arendt's death. Um, but I've been thinking recently that I think she would have very mixed feelings about identity politics because of its um, tendency to identify people according to their um, ethnic or um, racial grouping rather than it, uh, in, in relation to their status as individuals. And so, um, and of course, you know, one of, the one of the ways she connects plurality to politics is through uh, people forming what she calls voluntary associations. And of course, uh, identity politics is not a voluntary association. You might even go so far as to call it to the extent that there is an association, it's an involuntary one because you don't get to choose whether, you don't get to choose the color of your skin or the ethnic group to which you belong. That's something that's socially determined um, otherwise, uh, other than by yourself. So I think she, I think she would, um, she be, she's fervently believes in the importance of voluntary association because she thinks that's the beginning of politics. Um, but I think she would want to make a distinction between that and what we're now coming to know as identity politics. And I think that's a, an instructive contrast that's worth thinking about. So that's my first observation on your um, um, uh, themes. Um, on the public and the private, I just wanted to say that um, uh, you, you mentioned that she was a student of Heidegger, uh, in, and indeed she was, and of course, um, you cannot imagine Arendt's philosophy without uh, Heidegger being, uh, having been her teacher. Um, but it's quite interesting because pr probably the most important uh, um, dif dif difference or change she made between what she learned from Heidegger and what she developed for herself 
has to do with the phenomenon, the, 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 the dual phenomenon of the public and the private. Because um, in, in her introduction to um, Men in Dark Times, to which you referred with the uh, Benjamin essay, she actually quotes uh, Heidegger and his um, distaste for what he called, quote, the glare of the public. Um, and in fact, I think Arendt doesn't disagree that in the public there is a glare. When you are out in public, you are exposing yourself and you are at risk. And of course, those become parts of her definition of action. Um, and, uh, and so, and of course, the phenomenon of the private, which for her is the kind of um, binary opposite of the public, um, as, you, as you've pointed out, has to do with kind of intimacy and security. And you even you quote, had the quote about it giving you a shield against the outside world, a kind of protection. So she's, she's very interested. I mean, I think that the, the use of the term threshold is quite wise on your part here, because she's very interested in the back and forth uh, aspect of human experience between the public and the private, and the, uh, the, the necessity, in fact, of both. Um, and the, necess but the necessity of both, but also the necessity of preserving the distinction between the two. And that, of course, as I have said, is despite everything that she learned from Heidegger, that's the most significant uh, difference uh, from his philosophy that she developed for herself. Um, um, I think, by the way, she pro the, the, phenomenon, the phenomenon of the things of the world, I'm inclined to think that that actually comes from Heidegger as well, because, of course, he was interested in things. In fact, Think thingliness is one of the uh, characteristics of his philosophy. So I think she 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 got that also from him. But again, in her hands, it mutated into this idea of the world and um, and this notion, which again you quoted, and I think it's correct that the the primary definition of durability for her is that it's la longer than the human life, because of course. She's very, she's interested in natality. Um, and of course, birth is a new beginning. And she, and of course, um, <laughs> beginnings are part of her idea of action. But she's also equally as um, uh, acknowledging, I think this is the right word, of the phenomenon of mortality. We will all die. Um, and, but the world will not die, or at least it won't necessarily die. And that's what that's why the world is able to give our lives stability because it is more stable than we are ourselves. So it's I think it's that that little little con construct of commentaries that leads to her idea of the phenomenon of action, which she sees as what is possible in the public realm and is a function of what people can do when they are acting together. I, I didn't. I didn't hear. I think your last sentence. Uh, strangely oh, enough, I was just going to say that the um, uh, you 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 uh, you describe the kind of hierarchy between labor, work, and action um, correctly, as as I understand her. Um, um, we are all, you know, because of um, the bodily condition of our existence, we all necessarily labor we have to because otherwise we we, we would not survive um, we can work and working is how we make the world um, um, and then for some of us who have the courage to go out in public as I've called it then that's when the possibility of action comes up but for action we need to be among our peers and to be able to engage with them in ways which um, uh, would not some some aspects of which would not necessarily be obvious to ourselves without the participation of other people uh, in the world with us. Uh, maybe it's worth just one last footnote that I think one of her other debts to Martin Heidegger is her fascination with etymology. Um, um, it, I mean, I've said that I one of the reasons I was so excited by the human condition was her critique of utilitarianism. 
but it had never occurred to me uh, in, in the modern world, in casual speech, we tend to use the words labor and work interchangeably. Um, but it's of, co of course from Arendt that I learned that they're not really interchangeable. And in fact, it's when you start to look at them etymologically that you learn that they're not interchangeable. And, um, and so for me, it was quite startling to realize that how she's able to point out that in English, we have labor and work. In French, we have travail and oeuvre. In Italian, we have um, lavoro and opera. And in German, we have work, werk and arbeit. In all, so universally in Europe, this historical distinction is there. And there are these different words that refer to it. So the etymology is also a kind of very powerful Heideggerian legacy in her thought for me. Although in Europe, we also use it interchangeably. Uh, well, that's because of modernity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's of course what she traces uh, uh, then. The, um, what I wondered, uh, George, is uh, indeed when it comes to this relation to, uh, um, of, the, the, of, of course, Arendt is very strict in her distinction between labor, work, and uh, action. And architecture belongs to, uh, mainly to work because it produces uh, things that last, uh, you could uh, say. Yeah, it's it's not uh, well. Of course, Frampton can Frampton uh, picks up the idea uh, that there is this uh, um, uh, more and more uh, also in architecture labor going on, uh, which is actually uh, stressed of um, evoked by more economic thinking. Economy economy is actually for her the ec economy of the household and thus belongs to the to the to labor uh, section but i wondered actually do you also see um but that's of course the question we also ask in uh, in the oase do you also see action as part of the profession of architecture of the architect uh well um well that's a for me that's a complicated and difficult question and i'm not quite sure when you say as a profession then that's the qualification that makes me hesitate obviously the architect has the same capacity to act as any other person so certainly the architect has the capacity to act whether that the architect is acting in his capacity as he's certainly working in his capacity as an architect there's no question about that um and to the extent that he is a kind of sort of participant in public discourse about architecture, I mean, I suppose that's a kind of action. Uh, I do think, by the way, that, that um, sometimes she's criticized for using these terms, which people see as polarized. And But my own sense of it is that in her work, she doesn't see them so much as polarized as, um, you know, nuanced gradations. So that um, I don't, I don't think she would. As so long as one acknowledges the importance of the distinction, I don't think she has any problem with blurring the the, the boundary lines between them. Um, so in that sense, um, I think um, the architect probably does have the capacity to act. Uh, but, it, but but that does not mean that that work is action. No, we we, we will come back uh, to that uh, later. I always. Uh, well, I, of course, also am uh, uh, thinking about that uh, in, in how far you can see design as starting things new, things that are not yet known, and you also don't know where it ends. So uh, do you, uh, the, of course, there is this kind of parallel between, uh, there's kind of parallel between design and action in that sense. But, but still, it's, of course, it's work. You, uh, you need to draw it in order to, uh, uh, to bring it further uh, as well. It's not something that is immediate, uh, like uh, aren't uh, uh, assigns action. But it's, 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 it's a form of starting things anew and also to show uh, other peers, let's say, how things can be. So how, how do you reflect on the, on the, on the activity of design? Oh, uh, well, I... I don't. I agree with the characterization you just made. It it obviously it does it does new and show how things could be. Um, and so to uh, to the extent that both of those are action, then um, 
Yes, you are right. Um, that having been said, however, you never know, the architect never knows how the artifact he or she has created is going to be used. I mean, so, so to the extent that there's any capacity for architecture to generate action, um, the ways in which it will do so are not within the architect's control. And in fact, that's part of the unpredictability of the situation. Uh, so, um, uh, so I, I mean, I tried to, and, you know, I, well, you know the public space book that I've written. It's one of the things I tried to do there is to um, um, articulate this distinction a little further. And that's, that's why I described visibility um, propinquity and continuity as essential characteristics of, of architecture in relation to publicness. And of course, you can't have action without publicness. No. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I, don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's a subtle discussion we're having, uh, but I don't think there's a fundamental disagreement here. No. no. Oh. Uh, that brings me actually to the, the, the question also. I don't know if we disagree on that point, but but of course we, uh, in the in the OAS, we mention or we refer to Bonnie Honig, who actually um, asks, uh, well, or uh, asks the question if things can act uh, and right. act in a sense, well, they communicate, they communicate a, a certain message, you could uh, could say. That's, that's actually where she starts, uh, I think, that and, and uh, uh, her reference here is public things, like a library, right. of course, uh, a library, it, it, it uh, well designed, I would say, and open to the public, communicates the message how important reading uh, is in this society, or also a public thing like a, uh, a city hall. It, of course, communicates how we think of politics in uh, within our societies, uh, you could uh, say. But then she asked this question, can public things act? And uh, well, right. previously you said, well, there I disagree. So I'm, of course, very curious to your arguments. Uh, right. Well, because I don't, I, uh, this, this, this discussion is reminding me a bit of contemporary discussions about the relationship of humans and animals. Um, and, and, you know, as I'm sure you're aware, there are many thinkers like Bruno Latour would be a, an example of someone who's interested in some almost a sort of version of animals' rights, if you like. Um, and, um, and so to, to the extent that animals could be conceived to have rights, um, and I suppose it's, it, it raises some issues which are rather parallel to you're talking about things being able to act. Um, I was at a discussion in New York um, last year with the, the French philosopher Jacques Rancière, and it was interesting that he he said he, he wanted to underscore, he was not arguing for the maltreatment of animals, obviously, and I think the maltreatment of animals obviously lies at the basis of this kind of discussion, but he was insisting that animals could not um, he didn't say act, but he, it, we, it implied act in the way that men and women can, and the main reason being that they cannot speak. And he saw speech as the, the kind of defining character, you know, the essential defining characteristic of action. And of course, for Arendt, you know, speech and combat are the two essential modes of action. So, um, so I'm... I'm, I'm leaning to that side in this discussion, despite the subtlety of the distinction. Well, and also despite, let's say, your preview, well, the, the, I, I was also, well, not, not in the sense that uh, you, you started actually your, your theoretical career also with this kind of meaning in architecture, where there is actually this wool uh, semiotics uh, discourse, where, where there is kind of language uh, attached yes. to buildings, let's say, which is speaking to an audience oh, in right, any right. way. Architecture but, parlant, yes, yeah. indeed. Right. Well, um, uh, it, but it's really a, a question. Architecture parlant really refers to a mode of semantic reference, really. It's not, um, you don't actually see the buildings opening their mouths and talking. No, no. Not even Ledoux. <laughs> no. <laughs> 
in his nice drawing. Well, the, of course, of course, the um, the thing is, of course, indeed, uh, for R and action and speech, they belong together. And in that sense, there is no action which cannot be explained in a way. Yeah? So the, the speech for R and is also it's you need to explain what you're actually are uh, are doing uh, in a way and in order to invite others to. Uh, join the action, uh, you could uh, say, and, that, and that, which is not uh, action in concert is not possible, I think, without language in that uh, in that sense. The, the thing is, of course, uh, the things that surround us, and that's also what Arendt argues, that they also define us in a way. So they have an impact on us. Yep, um, oh, for sure, for yeah. sure. But that's but 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 that's of course a, a kind of slow action, you could uh, you could say, you, which you cannot well, join in. Uh, in uh, slow and indirect and unpredictable <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah i see there is no not yet uh, questions in the in the uh, in the chat so uh, uh, in that sense we i we can of course invite a few questions also but uh, but they are not yet there but then indeed mention it in the in the in the chat and then we can give you the the word uh, in a way um what I what I um, like to go back to this plurality. I, I really liked it actually how you uh, um, let's say reflected uh, on on that also in the identity politics. I also have the idea that that Arendt uses that that idea of plurality um, to stress the kind of multiple aspects of the world uh, that are uh, that 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 actually reveal to us only. Uh, if we are, let's say, part of an uh, of a communi community in a, in a way, so the world only becomes real as he states um, when we are when we share, let's say, our experiences uh, uh, of the world. I, I see that in a way also as a as an ar architectural thing because uh, the how we perceive the world is also part, let's say, of how how architecture offers, let's say, this kind of perceivement because that it's about uh, how we indeed enter the world how we ha or private public and and other uh, thresholds i would uh, i would say um is there also because you bring up this idea of identity politics i think that aren't also uh, uh, indeed i i think that aren't was ver is very critical about identity politics and that it's much more about the kind of politics of belonging to a certain uh how how do you how do you call that uh, uh rightly in in english indeed uh, that the world is the shared thing and that our shared experience of the world that that is the the incentive of uh of this kind of uh, uh, voluntary association engagement in that in that shared world which is not uh, a shared world only in, uh, in uh, through particular identities but it's it's shared because we are we all live in that world uh, in a way would you also right. see that as a as the direction? Yes, I agree. And and do you see there also an, an architectural uh, assignment uh, there? Because that's a little bit that we suggest, of course, uh, here. Uh, although I don't know in concrete ways how that might uh, uh, offer an, an, an uh, or, well, it's not predefining architecture, of course, but. Well, you know, um... I, I once wrote an essay about the new urbanism in which I made a an, a, an argument against um, gated communities. And um, part of my argument against gated, gated community, I mean, the, the idea of a gated community is that it keeps the people inside safe and it keeps the bad people outside, outside. Um, 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 but, it dawned on me that it's actually not that simple because if you're um, a teenager or if you're an elderly person, it can be just as unsafe to be inside the gated community as it can be to be outside of it because you may need help and not be able to get it or you may not be able to interact with any friends because um, there aren't any uh, people in your age bracket there, so so um, you know I'm uh, you're quite right about the shared world, but we need we need other people not only um, 
in order to uh, do things together, but we even need the other people to be able to figure out who we actually are ourselves. We actually find out who we are what, um, from other people's um, interactions with us. She, um, you probably remember it somewhere in the human condition, she uses the word demon in the old fashioned sense. Um, I think it's Greek. Um, the, you know, again, precedes the modern devaluation of the word where a, a demon now necessarily means some kind of evil spirit. Whereas for the Greeks, the demon, it was like um, your persona which sat on your shoulder, which meant that you, other people could see it, but you can't see it yourself because it's always behind you. Um, and so that's her metaphor for the formation of the personality of the individual as a result of exchange with others in the world. So it's, it's it, even to be yourself, you need the other people. In, in that sense, the, 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 the gated community and other, let's say, things are, are let's say, structural wrong in two uh, ways. Uh, first, of course, it's, it's defining the world only through a, a particular uh, uh, a group of people that sometimes even are selected uh, uh, in a way, and that uh, discloses others of being part of that same world too. Uh, and the other is indeed that you actually you you become shallow if you are part of that uh, you, uh, uh, in a way yes. because you don't yes. uh, often uh, yeah, you have a very shallow section of of the world right. that uh, that re that uh, that that defines in that sense your your mirror. Yes, uh, your yes, your experience is truncated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's nice. Uh, that's you know, I've read also. I, yeah, I'm read. This goes back to the etymology again. Um, um, uh, uh, she, it was interesting to learn that um, that again in the in the in in in, in the ancient world, uh, the punishment for misbehavior was not imprisonment, but banishment. You were not you, you were not allowed to live amongst the rest of us. You were forced <laughs> to go away, and be by yourself in the, in the wilderness. Um, so, um, and, and of course, it's quite interesting that, that in that sense, the, the etymology of the word outlaw, because in effect, it means the, the, the as with the wall you described in your quotation, it's a, it, the, the law is seen of a form of, as a form of protection. And for those who do not behave appropriately, um, they have, they are forced to live outside the law, which is what, yeah. which is of course, the long form of saying outlaw. So outlaw. it's again, it's a very interesting uh, conceptual uh, idea of you know the, the sp spatial location here in relation to plurality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there was a question went by, but I didn't see the end of it. Yeah, I, I see it also a question, but it's it's uh, I don't know if you can if you can. Um, Shall I unmute answer that in five minutes? Yes. Shall I unmute uh, Kira? Is that useful? Yeah, we can we can do that. Yeah. Hi, yeah. great uh, lecture so far, very interesting. I'm interested to know, since we've been talking a lot about language and um, sort of its relevancy in architecture and such, I'm interested to know, like, what do you think of the coining of new terms in recent theory, like such as the works of Venkatesh Rao, who produces theory that's like very of its time, maybe theories that are relevant in the next six months, but not in the future. And also like, what about language in, and the coining of these new terms in the context of identity politics? Like in France, they have a national academy to kind of protect language, whereas like English seems to be especially successful for its capability to freely evolve. If that makes sense. <laughs> Actually, I I I uh, I have to admit that I don't know uh, Venkatesh Rao, so I can't answer uh, uh, that. Well, I, way, I, I, yeah. I I and I don't either, but I mean. Uh, Certainly, to the second part of the question, I, I can answer that. Um, for uh, language, does language evolves and language needs to evolve? Or at least that this is my opinion, at least. Um, but the but what I would say is that it it's problematic. It problematic it, if it evolves too quickly, 
because if it evolves too quickly, people can't keep up with you know, the nuances of difference which are implied between the difference between the new words and the, and, and the, the, the older words. Um, so I'm, my, my view of language is one which calls for gradual evolution in which the layering of, of terminology from different eras is um, always visible, one on top of the other. I mean, otherwise you get into a situation which, you know, since teenagers are, are very good at, um, um, you know, coming up with new terminology, but it's often the case that their overall vocabulary is not very wide. And I think that's a problem of the evolution having gone too fast. Their, 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 their ability to invent new terms, it's good for, um, you know, uh, small group conversation, but it, 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 what it gains in intimacy, it loses in depth. So I, th I think we need, we, need, we, need, we need languages with depth. Um, so I'm, I, um, I, but, I don't, but I also agree that, it, that it, the language, there's no point in trying to freeze the language that, in fact, it, it usually never works anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It changes anyway. Yeah. I, yeah. I, for me, for me, that also, let's say, has a kind of reference to what I see in the Netherlands, of course, where there is a quite a big uh, pressure to uh, uh, change to English uh, in 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 teaching and in uh, well uh, on on all uh, levels uh, of of schools even. And on the one hand, uh, of course, that makes uh, us quite flexible internationally. But it also uh, we we lose, uh, let's say, the capacity to really in, in nuanced ways to discuss uh, things that are close to heart, let's say, and even uh, discuss architecture in a very nuanced uh, way, I, I have the feeling, because we uh, think that we know all the terms. Well, that's also my experience, of course. Well, my, most of my work is in English, but I, I am much more precise in my Dutch than in, in my English, uh, because I don't know all the, um, the, the connotations uh, in a way. But uh, for me, actually, also when I refer to Arendt, I think it's very important to still see that even if language changes, that there is traces of a kind of history and ideas uh, that come with language. So, and they, uh, we inherit them, but when the language changes uh, quite a bit, of course, we have the feeling maybe that we have lost them, but they still are present uh, somewhere. I think uh, that, that's what she brings to the fore, I think. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Yeah, it's interesting too because I've been uh, working a lot with a friend of mine who is Swiss German and I'm Canadian so uh, English is my first language and it's interesting like how we view uh, like there are connotations to words sometimes that he misses out like for example he it will be like the word overthinking for example which sounds like you're thinking for him almost he's thinking uh, so much but for me it's or in the english language it's a bit of a negative connotation like you've over overthought too much to the point that it's causing confusion right yeah. Yeah. do you know the do you know the famous phrase that translation is betrayal <laughs> it goes with what you just said lost in translation uh Alice, there's also a, a question of Katrin. Is there, is time of Katrin Kukuk? Is there a time? Uh... Yes, let, well, let's run for, for five more minutes, but then we have we do have to stop. Thank you. And Katrin is of course our uh, let's say um, uh, also the editor of Oasis, so I, it's nice to meet her here. It, uh, can she just ask her a question? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I already typed it as well, but I was yeah. wondering, like in the discussion that you were having before. Um, what the role, so the world and the physical or architectural world definitely has a role to play in um, providing for stability that enables action to, to emerge. But I was wondering if you could reflect on if it also plays a role in allowing for contestation, which I think is part of action, or if it maybe can also spark contestation, as I think it does now, for example, in the discussions around um, the colonial statues around the world, for example, uh, that have recently been sparked by the Black Lives Matter movement's protests, for example. 
Uh, well, um, I, I, I can. Am I muted? No. No, I'm I can okay. hear you. I can yeah. have a. Go, I can have a go at that. And uh, the, my my first thing will be one of the most wonderful anecdotes. And there's an essay of Arendt on one of her. Well, I was going to say heroes, but my heroines, and this is Rosa Luxemburg. And she, descri she describes an, an, an incident at a, a meeting of the Socialist International somewhere in Europe in around 1900. And so it's a meeting of the, the leaders of the Socialist parties from the various European countries. Um, and they're discussing policy proposals and what they could work together on and so, and so forth and so on. And she has tabled a proposal for, of a, for a policy in respect of some issue or other. And um, Jean Jaurès, who is at the time the leader of the French Socialist Party, makes a, a, a furious speech opposing her, her idea and explaining what a bad idea it is and why the, the meeting should not agree to accept Rosenberg's proposal. Now, of course, he does it, he makes this speech in French and 1900 is before the days of simultaneous translation. And so there are a number of the, the delegates from other uh, uh, countries that did not, un they understood, understood how vehement he was, but they didn't understand exactly what it was he was saying. And so they were, they were looking around for someone to translate what he said into German. Um, and as it happened, there was no one at, the, at that point in the meeting comfortable Voluntary, voluntary to do that, except for one person who was Rosa Luxemburg herself. And so she stood up and uh, agreed to deliver the best translation she could of this speech she had just made attacking her. It's such a wonderful story. <laughs> and it sort of captures um, um, uh, antagonism and combat and magnanimity all in the same image. It's just remarkable. Very nice story, actually. It's a fantastic story. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, actually, the, the, the thing is, of course, um, Arendt, Arendt, Arendt indeed has a kind of uh, agonistic idea of public space, which is in a way shared. And I think that uh, when, you, when you bring it, well, it, the, the, the world is shared. And therefore, you can have this kind of conflict uh, uh, thing. I, I think so. Um, well, the, the uh, in that sense, it's of course difficult. We emphasized here, indeed, on these thresholds to secure uh, the the public space. But I I would say that uh, that public space, of course, has all sorts of uh, uh, um, touchstones in a way, or stones that you stumble. Uh, 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 over in a way, in a way, but it's it's since you still uh, if you hold true that you share the world together uh, that you that you that the world is common to us all, then you then it also can be let's say that there are these kind of agonistic uh, uh, moments and and uh, and contestations. Uh, I think as long as you hold this uh, uh, true uh, uh, there. But I I don't know exactly. Yeah. So what what does it mean for Arctic or for the for the real world? In, at first, I would say don't make too much statues. But that's uh, the heroes of today are of course the well, well you know the foolish there, people. There, of, of yeah. There's a um, many years ago, um, I was involved in um, a, an exhibition catalog which included an essay by a French historian about. Um, destruction and vandalism during the French Revolution, and there was a very interesting argument about how the um, one of it became one of the responsibilities of the French intellectuals who were part of the revolution to to persuade the so-called uh, enragé, the kind of angry populace, not to destroy all the legacy of the Ancien Regime, even though. They did not uh, disagree that the Ancien Regime should end, but they did not want to destroy all the art. So they, they went to the defense of the paintings of Watteau, the portraits of the, of the kings and so forth and so on, saying that it, was, that it was wrong to destroy them. And they actually managed to protect um, a large legacy of French culture. Um, 
So my view of the, the current controversy about the statues is the same, that the statues need to come down off the pedestals. Um, there's no doubt about that. But they, they should not be destroyed because, um, um, you know, we, they're part of history. And they, what, they, what needs to be done is that they have to be recontextualized. And it is the job of architects and artists to figure out the appropriate ways of recontextualizing them. I mean, in this regard, I'm very fond of this. There's a, another quotation from Walter Benjamin. I have not found this in, in my own reading of Benjamin, but uh, Frederick Jameson quotes it very frequently. Uh, this is Walter Benjamin. There is no document of civilization that is not also a document of barbarism. Mm. There's a lot that, Walter Benjamin, as we know, was a very wise man, and that's a very wise observation. Yeah. We just have to live with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs>